Namaste, everyone. Michelle Granberg here. Welcome to another episode of Positive Energy, bringing enlightening television for your evolving soul. On this show, we're talking about people and their pets. St. Hubert's Animal Welfare Center works tirelessly to keep people and their pets together. More than just a shelter, St. Hubert's is the largest provider of animal services in our region, touching the lives of over 100,000 animals each year. Stay with us to learn how you can keep your pet healthy, happy, safe, and thriving. Positive Energy starts right now. So welcome St. Hubert's, um, Adrian Carson, uh, Director of Behavior and Training, and Diane Ashton, Director of Communications. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. And who did you bring with you today? This is Lady. Lady is a six month old mixed breed pup. She looks like she has uh, some hound in her lineage and she has brown eyes with a little bit of splash of blue in each eye. She's a really unique little puppy. And she's up for adoption, she is. like so many. And she's gorgeous, and I think she's gonna be scooped up right away. I agree. Because she's absolutely beautiful. So Diane, tell us about uh, the brief backstory of St. Hubert's and what is the mission of St. Hubert's? Sure, um, St. Hubert's is in Madison, New Jersey. Um, we were founded in 1939 by Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge. Um, yeah, she was a huge dog lover. Um, she bred championship dogs. She was heavily involved in the uh, dog shows like Morris Ex Essex Dog Show. She was actually one of the first female judges uh, for Best in Show at Westminster Dog Show. So she was heavily involved in that. Um, she wanted to start um, an animal shelter. Um, it was built um, uh, next to her home, uh, her property in Madison. Um, so over the years, um, it's expanded in terms of doing so many things for animals and for people. Um, uh, Mrs. Dodge died in 1973, and we've continued on with her legacy, helping animals. Um, I, I will say that we, uh, we no longer get money from the Geraldine Dodge Foundation. We rely on the generosity of private uh, donors to help us run. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that in um, 2019, we merged with the uh, Humane Rescue Alliance, uh, which is based in Washington, D.C., a great organization. Um, and together, we've been able to do so much. Um, now, each year, we help, um, oh, we touch the lives of over 100,000 animals. Um, we are the largest provider of animal services in our region. Wow, <laughs> that is quite an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. I know there's a couple of programs that are really important and unique to your organization. Um, one is a community program that provides free pet food and uh, free or low cost vaccines, spay and neuter services and emergency boarding. Do you wanna say anything about that program? Um, sure, yeah, community services is a big part of what we do. Um, we want to help people with their pets through the stage, many stages uh, from the time they adopt, um, and we want to keep people with their pets, and sometimes they run into problems. Um, maybe they um, can't afford uh, pet food, so we have uh, free pet food, um, uh, pet food banks. Um, we also do um, free uh, vaccination clinics in cities like Irvington and Patterson. Um, so we, uh, we just had one recently. We had over 500 people come. 500 pets were, um, uh, got vaccinations at this one-day clinic in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, we also offer low-cost and um, sometimes free medical care because yeah. it can be very expensive. Um, and I'll say that when we had our vaccination clinic, it was amazing. Um, some of, many of these pets had never seen a vet before. So we're really providing great services to communities uh, throughout New Jersey. Oh my gosh, it is so needed. Another needed service is the way station transport 
transport program. Mm -hmm. I know that you move animals from overcrowded shelters to places where people can actually meet them and adopt them. So anything you want to say about that important program? Yeah, um, it, our, our program, our waste station program, is probably the premier um, transport program in the, in the U.S. Um, so we provide, we move 20,000 animals um, we've ha moved over 20,000 animals since the program started in, in 2016. Um, and what we're doing is we're moving animals from areas, what we call areas of need, um, usually overcrowded shelters down south, to areas of opportunity, which are usually sh uh, shelters up in the northeast, where people really want to adopt pets. Um, we have over 90 um, transport partners around the country that uh, join in this effort to help animals move from overcrowded shelters to places where they can be adopted. So it's an amazing program. Um, and it's not just about moving animals. What we do is anytime that an animal is adopted uh, at a destination shelter, that shelter has give back funds. In other words, a portion of the adoption fee is given back to the source shelter um, to be invested in spay and neuter um, programs. So what we're really trying to do is get to the root problem, the root issue that is causing overpopulation in these areas down south. Um, it's an amazing program. We, we um, take all kinds of animals. We don't um, pick and choose. We want those sh uh, source shelters to have lots of great animals in their own shelters. Um, I also want to say that, um, you know, some people say, well, what about the animals here in New Jersey? We, we take animals from all different sources. It's not just shelters down south. Um, we help animals throughout New Jersey. We would never turn away an animal, a local animal, to bring in an animal. Um, and the last thing I want to say that I think is really great about the transport program is we help shelters in times of crisis. So if there is a, a natural disaster like a hurricane, um, flooding down south, we will help transport animals that are already in the shelter waiting to be adopted. We bring them up here uh, to shelters where they can be evacuated so that the shelters, when they're having these crises and they need room in their shelter for displaced pets during hurricanes or earthquakes, um, like in Puerto Rico, for example, we make room in those shelters so those shelters can help the animals in their communities that need help, emergency boarding, things like that until they can be reunited with their owners. So it's really an amazing program. It is absolutely life-saving work. It's <laughs> absolutely life-saving work. You're really, really fulfilling a need. So thank you for all of that. Um, so, you know, we have Lady here, and so we want to talk a little bit about the, the beauty and the wisdom of dogs and cats. And so I know you work closely, um, Adrian, with them. One question I have is when, when people are looking to adopt, what tips do you have so they can find the right match for their household? Um, well, I would say look at your lifestyle and see, I mean, if you are an active person and you know that you want to come home from work every night and go for a jog, then you might want a more of an active dog, a more of a young, energetic type animal that maybe the shelter will say needs exercise. If you're a little <laughs> bit more laid back, maybe pick something a little smaller, maybe a little something, maybe a little something maybe older that's less energetic. Um, and just be honest with yourself. You might love an, an animal the way it looks. I mean, this is a cute little hound. Um, but you know, this might be too much for someone who really, you know, wants to come home and just watch Netflix in the evening. <laughs> so, you know, this puppy's going to be. And you want a couch potato dog. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, we've got some, some older characters for that that can slide right in and be a great family pet. Yeah, that's a great tip. So try to can think about your lifestyle, match the dog to your lifestyle as much as you can so you can be set up to really succeed. That's right. So you're a behaviorist means that you have the experience and the training in understanding dog psychology, cat psychology, and behavior. So what, do, what kind of ways do people most, most often misinterpret their animals or maybe project their own sort of opinions and thoughts onto that? And we know animals do things for their own reasons. We don't always understand, but we're trying to understand why. What do you want people to know about sort of the nature of, of that? Well, that animals need enrichment. They need physical exercise. We know that, right? But we, they also need mental enrichment, Just mental like stimulation. Just yeah, like us. right. And they can't read a book. They can't sign up for a you know a, a night course you know to to stimulate their their brains. And so if we don't set them up for success in the household um, mentally, right? Like um, by you know a dog's version of of taking an online course might be uh, chewing a puzzle toy that's stuffed with food or um, you know some things that help to de-stress them because dogs also 
also suffer from stress. Dogs can suffer from mental health issues if they're bored or if they're under understimulated. And so it's it's very important to find um, to find uh, exactly what your dog needs to be his best, not just physically but also mentally as well. And so um, it's it is important for us to to look at dogs as dogs and understand that while there are similarities between people and animals, they are their own individual uh, species, and it's important to know that. And then they're all individual, individuals within those individual Correct. species. There's a lot of They have history, and they, mm -hmm. yeah, some are traumatized, and there's so much to consider. And I'm glad you're pointing out not just to take care of their physical needs, which is important, but their mm -hmm. mental and emotional needs are equally as important. So when someone adopts and they bring home a new, you know, pet for the first time, Typically, how long does it take for a new pet to adapt to a new environment, and how can the new pet parents help a new pet acclimate? And what are some of the, the most common issues that arise with new pets? Okay, so, so back to them being individuals, it depends. You can bring home an animal that really needs to be handled um, very carefully and be given a very quiet area to set up and slowly acclimate to the sounds of a home. I mean, we have some animals that come from maybe more um, outdoor uh, environments where all of a sudden one day you bring them in and you turn on a ceiling fan and they think what is that helicopter mm -hmm. on the ceiling like they just have never seen one before so some animals need you to really take it slow and to be there for them and to help to reassure them other animals you adopt them and they walk in like they've owned the place forever so um, so it's a lot about patience and observation and learning about the individual animal that you you have in front of you and trying not to compare the animal too much to maybe an animal that you've had in the past that's really one. That's re that's right. Get to know mm -hmm. your new animal. Be patient. Mm -hmm. It takes time. Everybody's getting used to one another, and yeah. the new sights and the new smells. And we have to recognize that their sense of smell and hearing is much more acute than ours. Mm -hmm. So there's a, really a lot to consider with all of that. So 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 then, how about a shy or anxious mm -hmm. dog? What are the best sort of ways to handle and help a shy or anxious dog? Well, shy or anxious animals really do like familiarity. They um, so I would create a, a, a safe station for them. You know, a nice cozy space. You know, a little carpet. Put a put a, a crate there with some comfy cushioning, and so they can be in their crate and they can decompress. And um, you can close the door and keep it nice and quiet. And you can go in there and let them. You know, sit, sit sit on the floor with them. Let them sniff. Let them explore. And then as they start to look at you as the uh, the safety, um, you know, the safety raft. They and you together can start to go out and explore new places. So you may not be able to take a, a shy fearful out for a walk or a hike right away, but you may be able to sit on the front steps with them for a little while and, you know, and get them used to your front steps until they decide that maybe they want to start to sniff a little further out onto the front lawn and then eventually go for a walk. So it's a little bit more about um, taking the journey with the animal than mm -hmm. about saying, you know, I want to, I demand that you immediately start hiking with me by Tuesday. <laughs> I love that. So how about a hyperactive dog? Okay. How can we best handle and help those? Well, dogs can suffer from real disorders that veterinary behaviorists and, um, and veterinarians can diagnose. So there are dogs that um, their hyperactivity may actually be a have a clinical diagnosis. That, but there are far more animals who are just under-exercised or under under-stimulated or just not maybe having their needs met. And those dogs um, can be helped through increasing their exercise um, or increasing their mental stimulation and it is really important to be flexible because if you are um, I've seen people um, maybe take a dog that is just does not seem to be settling in the house maybe they're destroying things maybe they're you know barking and scraping at the windows every time something goes by and um, and so if the solution becomes oh, I walked him for an hour and then I started to walk him for two hours a day and then I started to walk him for four hours a day and the needs are still not being met through walking all the walking in the world is not going to solve the problem sometimes a half an hour of jumping and running and and bouncing around in a park with other dogs might be the solution for that that animal so sometimes seeking professional help to help to give you some ideas because I've seen people come in really distraught. They truly tried. I mean, they rearranged their whole lives to walk the dog more, but walking wasn't the answer for that dog. So it's really about having an open mind and being flexible enough to, to try to find out what your individual animal actually needs. 
So you work a little bit with them one-on-one -on -one at the shelter prior to being adopted and you want them to continue some of the training. So what are some of the, the most important basic commands that a, that a pet owner can learn? We have a, um, a very busy uh, training school that is open to the public. We offer private training, we offer group classes, and, um, and in those classes, our basic training course consists of uh, the basics like um, eye, eye contact, teaching the dog to pay attention to you when you give him a cue, because then we have the ability to look at the dog and give them um, commands like sit, and down and wait and stay, things for safety. I mean, if I wanted to get down the uh, stairs with a laundry basket, I might want to teach my dog to wait at the top of the stairs. Let me get down first, okay, and release the dog and let the dog come down rather than us trying to squeeze together. Um, so using the, the types of behaviors, walking nicely on leash so that mm. you know it becomes more enjoyable for us to go out together. Um, we find that training leads to freedom and leads to better relationships between animals and people. And the animals get much more access to good things in life if they're more well behaved. So it's really not about bottling them up. It's really about teaching them great skills that they can be rewarded for so that they can experience a richer life. It's so, so important. And it's fun too, right? To oh, work with your gosh. dog and see them pro <laughs> progress in that way. Mm -hmm. So we are going to stop for a moment and bring in a feline nice. that you have brought with you today named Al. So we're going to bring him in right now. Fantastic. So introduce us to Al. Who's <laughs> Al? This is Al, he's nine years old. He's a sweet senior, orange tabby. Um, he loves looking out windows. That's like his all time favorite activity. He's a very easy going, laid back um, cat who would make a great companion. And he's currently up for adoption he at is. St. Hubert's. He is, yes. So let's talk about cats a bit, uh, Adrian, as well. Like, I guess my first question is, what are your best tips for bringing home a new cat and for litter training a cat if that's necessary. Sure, um, whenever I bring home a new cat, I set them up in a bedroom and I, uh, I, I give them a safe space, like so I might, might leave a crate in there in case they wanna hide, like a little carrier, I'll leave it open so they can go in and out if they want to. But then I'll also make sure that they have access to some vertical space. Cats really need to be able to, to rise above the floor level. So I might put in a cat tree or make sure that there's a piece of furniture that they can get up onto like a table so they can look out a window, just like he loves to do. Um, so, um, you know, that those are some basic cat needs. And the litter box, it will always be clean. <laughs> That's another thing. Um, cats are very fastidious, and if you don't scoop it after, sometimes after each, uh, each movement, they will sometimes reject the litter box. And so it's super important to keep their mm -hmm. toilet area clean and, um, and not mm -hmm. to put the food and the, and, the, and the litter next to each other. Not because I mean, we wouldn't want other. to. We wouldn't like that. <laughs> right, we don't we want a wouldn't. table next to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> now I really feel like we're serving the cats. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're arranging their litter, their food, the whole thing to make sure everything is nice. The way, and, and I mean, he's just so gorgeous. And it's true that most orange tabbies are males. Yeah, right? most of them are. Occasionally we find a female. Uh, I think, what is it, 30% are females? 20%. Uh, I actually have an orange okay. tabby that's a female. So uh, yes, 80% are male. One it's of an the rare. interesting thing about them. Mm -hmm. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you ha have cats coming into the shelter, mm -hmm. do you get feral cats coming in from the street, stray cats? Do you mostly get surrenders? And in terms of socialization, how does that work? Well, I imagine they all have to be socialized anyway, no matter where they come from. To yes. some degree, they have to be. Yeah, I mean, they have to be acclimated to whatever life they're going to be living in living in, whatever lifestyle you're gonna bring them into, and hopefully it's a good match. Um, so we have animal control contracts, and f for, from the animal control contracts, we might get cats that didn't live in a home before. And so we have multiple programs um, at, our, at our organization. We do have two uh, feline behavior specialists at St. Hubert's who are um, at the ready to, to help decide whether or not cats, can, um, cats should be able to be returned to the outdoors. 
or whether or not they can actually be um, converted into indoor pets. So, so do they have like a list, a checkoff list that they check each of those things to see if they're able to be homed or not? Yeah, spending time with things them. Things they look for? Yeah, sure, absolutely, to make sure that they're, they're placed in the setting that is most comfortable for them. Yeah. Yes, again, so that they will be set up to succeed. Now this is, of course, here this is not a typical place, so I can understand. I mean, he wants to go and explore. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should we take a break and put Al back in? What do you think? Can we do that? We can do that. All right, <laughs> or we're going to take a, mo a moment and have Al go back into his comfortable uh, crate that he came in today. So we were talking about cats <laughs> and how special they are. Um, when folks take cats home, and sometimes they'll return them to the shelter, cats and dogs, mm -hmm. what are the most common reasons that someone might actually, and you have an open door policy, right? I would imagine. Oh, we do. For a good reason. You know, bring them back, you mm -hmm. want them to, if there really is an issue. You probably help them work through the issue maybe first. So what mm -hmm. is, what's sort of the, the non-negotiable where you say bring them back or they bring them back? You know, just like with, with humans, it's not always a good match, right? right. You can't just grab a hum another person off the street and say, okay, you know, we're going to be best friends for life. So, um, so we do understand that sometimes it's just a lifestyle mismatch. Maybe someone fell in love with an animal based on the way it appeared you know the way it looked and maybe it reminded them of a, of a pet they had before but it but maybe it really wasn't the right fit for them <laughs> so so sometimes it, it really isn't that the person um, was you know, there was nothing wrong with the person there was nothing wrong with the animal it was just sort of a mismatch right so um, that sometimes is one reason that we that we get a return yeah. and 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 yes we do try to resolve those issues I mean sometimes we can say hey if, if there's a particular behavior problem that's bothering you we can help you to try to resolve that with this particular animal but if it's if it's just too numerous or just over um, if it's too much for what the, for the person to be able to um, to handle then then yeah then we say you know what, come on back maybe we can try again with something maybe a little bit more your speed and that's okay we don't we don't condemn people for for making a you know making a mistake because we don't even even see it as a mistake we see it as trying and you tried yeah. and so maybe we'll try again and um, and we don't have you know we don't we don't uh, you know, we have some returns but we don't have you know people don't take advantage of it it's not like people are just picking up mm. cats and dogs and dropping them off like we're a library I mean that doesn't happen people really do come and they are trying to yeah. have a you know to adopt a family member for life so people should really feel like they're not going to be penalized for that they're not going to be shamed for that that you're encouraging them to communicate with you correct about these issues and if someone needs to surrender back then that's available to them. Right, because we want the people happy and we want the animal happy. We don't yeah. want the animal to have to live the rest of his life in a home that's just not a good match either. So it's a win-win when people have the confidence to come back and say, hey, can we try this again? So speaking of that, mm -hmm. successful adoptions, successful matches. Diane, you know, what is your adoption process like? Yeah. Well, if someone wants to adopt. Step one would be to look <laughs> at our website, uh, stHuberts.org. Um, we have all our animals listed, dogs, cats, and small animals like bunnies. Um, you can go there. You can take a look at their pictures, their profiles, get an idea of what the, you know, the dog or cat is about. Um, and then you're encouraged to either come into the shelter or we do have um, many animals in foster homes. So mm -hmm. you can either come into the shelter and adopt or you can um, meet either virtually or in person with the foster at their home um, or at the shelter and meet that animal and see if it's a good fit. And yeah, you know, we have open adoption policy. So you can come in, you can actually adopt and go home the same day with an animal, which is great. How are adoptions going these days? Um, they're going well. I mean, during the pandemic, obviously, we had a uh, huge, uh, there was a huge desire to adopt. Uh, but uh, we also had a ton of people fostering as well. So um, yeah, we continue to um, adopt out many animals. So besides adopting and fostering, are there any other ways people can best support St. Hubert's through donations, 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we always. always have a need for uh, for fosters. I mean, basically, either short term or longer term, um, dogs and cats need. Uh, it's so it's stressful in the shelter. I mean, we have a very nice shelter, but having said that, a best place for an animal is in a home, right? Mm -hmm. So um, people can foster, people can um, help by walking our dogs or even taking them on a field trip. Volunteering to walk, oh great. Volunteers, yes. Take them out. Yes, you can volunteer that way. Um, we even have over the holidays, uh, over Christmas time, you can bring home a pet uh, for the holiday, um, which is a great way to give a, a shelter pet a break at a special time of year. Um, and yes, um, volunteering. We need volunteers. We need help. Um, clean, you know, maybe you might clean kennels. Maybe you could help with enrichment with the dogs and the cats. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to get involved. And finally, yes, you can donate. We appreciate donations of pet food or uh, of funds to help our shelter operate. Good, so I hope people will reach out to you. It's easy to do that, to go to the website, mm -hmm. to donate, to donate your time or your money or your expertise in any way. So I really appreciate all the wonderful work that, that you are doing. You really are a wonderful resource for both people and animals. And like we said in the beginning, we want to keep them together. We want them to be happy together. So any final words, I guess, first from you, Adrian? Any final words for our folks? Um, as Diane said, I mean, we really do rely on the, the generosity of, of donors and, um, and volunteers. So, so yes, if, if you can spare the time or spare the money to, to help our programs, we would love to hear from you. Final words? Yeah, we have so much to offer. We have humane education programs. We have Buddy's Boutique, which is a boutique on our premises, and people can come and get their pet supplies, and all the funds go back into the shelter. Um, go to our website, explore what we have to offer. Whether you have a pet or are looking to adopt, mm -hmm. um, you'll find everything right there on the website. I love it. I love it. And look how relaxed Lady is. <laughs> is this not just the picture of relaxation and happiness and calmness? And this is bring home. Lady's still adopting right now, mm -hmm. so she's available. Every home needs. <laughs> yeah. Every home needs a lady. <laughs> she's wonderful. Or now for that. Or, or now. now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so very much. Remember Adopt Don't Shop. Thank you guys for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Another enlightening show. Please educate yourself on animal welfare and become involved at a shelter near you. And while you're at it, why not extend the same kindness to all species by not eating, wearing, or using animals in any way? Thank you, Monday Morning Flowers, for the beautiful floral arrangement. Thank you for watching. Check out michellegranberg.com, go vegan, and join me next time on Positive Energy. Mm -hmm.